after a midweek of firsts. His first goal in Major League Soccer. It's a beauty. Frustration. Looking for six and he scores. And farewells. Stop talking. Play the game. An immediate opportunity to go again in MLS with 10 fixtures played across the weekend. Our review of the action begins at Bank of California Stadium. One, two, three. Ah! Commentary comes from Matt Jackson and Phil Blacker. Certainly missing the majority of their attack, LAFC. Mark Anthony Kay has stepped in in recent matches to certainly help their offensive output. And they try and oh. force their way through here and ask the early questions of the referee. He gave nothing. Rami Tushian, it's his first big call. Yeah, it was an interesting one because it, there weren't too many appeals. This is worrying, though, for Mark Anthony Kay comes through the first one and then he's just overrun that slightly he's got no protection all oh, that's horrible that left ankle buckled right underneath him clutches for it straight away do really well to carry on here his afternoon over and Bob Bradley faces an anxious wait as does Mark Anthony Kay to find out the extent of the damage that's a sad sight so early Ladero it delivers really dangerously. That's the sort of quality that he can provide. Kelvin Leardam was the one arriving. He couldn't quite find the finish. It's a horrible situation for a goalkeeper to deal with players coming right on top of you, and they get away with one there. Smith, who is well advanced here, and in all sorts of space, he's got Bruin in support in the middle as well. Segura's challenge. Smith was still able to cut it back in the end. Now Ladero. Trying to hoist one high towards that far place for roll down. That's blocked. And back in it goes from Jordi Delem. And now from Ladero. And it's frantic stuff. Well, it is frantic. And Bob Bradley won't particularly like the fact that his side are under pressure. I think surely Najar can't have done a hamstring here, having just come on. I think it might just be as Najar tries to block that first cross. Oh, no. Bob Bradley will be wondering what earth is going on in his world here. Oh, how demoralised will he be? And he's been on, what, five, six minutes? Oh, it's a terrible situation. What can LAFC conjure up from the free kick? It's Edward Atuesta standing over it. Plenty of targets. Good ball, free header, opening goal for LAFC. Couldn't really miss from there, but it's quite some moment for Danny Masovsky. Very porous backline. We've seen two really poorly defended Three kicks, one of which LAFC got away with. Just can't drop, you've got to hold that line. It's a really easy chance. No Rossi, no Rodriguez, Vela injured. And yet still Danny Masovsky comes up with the opening goal for LAFC. Not unable to bring that one down, can he get his shot oh. away here? Leaves it instead for Bruin, who's missed it. The clearest side of goal so far. Impressive from Roldan in the build-up. Oh, he does brilliantly well, and he's so unselfish at the end. Takes a great touch here, times his run perfectly well. That's a great opportunity. And he kept two clean sheets all season. LAFC, but conceded at an average of two per game. Three kick is uh, in dangerously towards Laird. Dan Bruin was in there. Yamar, oh. and it's off the line by Jordan Harvey. Incredible contribution to keep that one out. It's a fine strike, but Harvey does brilliantly well. And that shot was hit with some venom. Torres to Harvey. Torres again, clipping in the cross. Mike Phillips, looked like he was attempting the spectacular. Oh. And that certainly was spectacular from Janela to double the lead for LAFC. And Seattle in serious trouble now. They just battle away, they keep the ball alive, a little bit of skill, maybe a hint of offside there. 
but this one doesn't quite sit for Bradley Wright Phillips. Little half a chance. What a strike that is. Comes off the laces perfectly. Well, Fry can't see it. Doesn't move. Watching the stage where they have to make this count. It's going to be Ladero to strike oh. in. It's sensational. And Seattle are right back in the game out of almost nothing. Said it had to be something special. He knows it's something special. Very hard to stop these. Look at the power. They've had two goalkeepers in, and they weren't stopping that one. Seattle right back in it. That's a blow for Bob Bradley. And away again. Through Jordan Morris this time. Segura trying to get back to him. Helped out by Sisney Yeager. Bruin in the middle. Unable to get the touch. Well, more surely got to be shooting rather than cutting that one back, you would think. Lakers stay down against Wright Phillips, able to cut it back for Blessing. Big stop by oh. Stefan Fry. Blessing goes down, it's thundered into the corner anyway by Masowski to make sure, and it might just make sure of the points. What a finish this is. It's Torres that's gambling. That's a fine strike in the first place, and Blessing goes in. Oh, he takes a really, takes a really big shot there from Yoma. A beautiful strike with the laces guided away from Stefan Fry. It's finished at Bank of California Stadium, LAFC 3, the Seattle Sounders 1. Great mentality to, to win a game where, man, there's so many things that just seem to be going against us. Um, but I'm really proud of the guys. Uh, some guys that haven't played regularly really did an excellent job tonight and an important, really good team win. The Portland Timbers' huge 6-3 win at the LA Galaxy in the week would have struck a chord with their latest opponents. It was only last month that the San Jose Earthquakes were on the wrong end of six goals at home themselves against the Timbers, though their start at Providence Park offered promise. Steve Clark called upon early on. But after a first half that wasn't soaked in chances, Portland hit their stride. Yaroslav Nia's Goddard's header less than 40 seconds after the restart was his first since scoring against the Earthquakes in September's 6-1 win. San Jose had undoubtedly improved since that mauling. They'd won three in a row to catapult themselves into the playoff picture, but the traits that made them so porous earlier in the summer returned again against the Timbers. Nia's Goddard presented with a simple second. If only the visitors were afforded such gifts. Scrappy Portland defending led to a straightforward goal for Tanner Beeson, or so he thought. A forensic video review of the incident eventually determined that Beeson was in an offside position when the ball was touched in his direction by a teammate. And if that left San Jose feeling low, the host delivered a telling blow with four minutes remaining. Felipe Mora had half the goal to aim at from another Diego Chara cross. Five wins in a row for the Timbers, and they're now level with Cascadian rivals the Seattle Sounders at the top of the Western Conference. The previous night at Providence Park saw Mark Dos Santos's Vancouver Whitecaps assume the role of the home team. Time was neither on theirs nor Real Salt Lake's side when it came to making the playoffs, and both were looking to dig themselves out of recent ruts. RSL helped their cause after 37 minutes when Damir Krylak opened the scoring. In added time at the end of the first half, a second RSL goal, scored by Marcelo Silva, followed, though the celebrations were short-lived. Krylak, who had had the initial shot, was in an offside position from the knockdown. Vancouver were blessed with more fortune midway through the second half, when Michael Baldissimo's free kick was headed over a despairing Andrew Putner for the equaliser. In trying to help out his defence, RSL forward Douglas Martinez inadvertently assisted the Whitecaps. Vancouver made the most of their luck. Four minutes later, they capitalised on some questionable RSL defending, and though Putner saved well from Freddie Montero, he couldn't keep Lucas Cavallini from giving the Whitecaps the lead. Cavallini had scored the late winner in their victory at RSL a few weeks earlier. And when Evan Bush tipped over substitute Corey Baird's header, it ensured the same outcome here. 
A huge lift for Vancouver, but another setback for Freddy Juarez's RSL. Nashville's injury problems in their forward line have realigned their focus to their defence. They'd only conceded once in four games, so any lead is often a telling one. They nearly had that just 60 seconds in at SKC through Rando Leal. At the heart of that excellent rearguard record has been Walker Zimmerman, but he's pretty handy in opponents' penalty areas too. His 15th minute header was the sixth goal that Nashville have scored from set pieces in MLS. It took SKC until after half time to summon a response. Johnny Russell glided away from the attention to tee up Gerso for an effortless equaliser. And the encouragement from those inside Children's Mercy Park fueled further belief. 60 seconds later, another threatening SKC attack, though this one was halted by Alistair Johnston. The fullback received a second yellow card as Nashville's game plan swiftly unravelled. SKC were intent on seizing the chance to make it three wins in nine days. Perennial substitute Eric Hurtado didn't quite get his angles right before Gerso was closer to landing the ball in nearby Kansas Speedway than the back of Nashville's net. But the host winner, provided by Hurtado with 11 minutes to go, was of the highest quality. A finish reminiscent of Marco van Basten's famous goal for the Netherlands 32 years ago, and one that belonged in front of an audience. It was Hurtado's first goal at home in over a year and leaves SKC beautifully positioned to challenge those at the top of the West. The calm before the literal storm in Florida as Inter Miami welcomed the Houston Dynamo to what was to become a rain-soaked Fort Lauderdale. Fresh from his match-winning performance in their previous game, Miami's Gonzalo Higuain was in an uncompromising mood. His well-crafted 1-2 with Lewis Morgan almost led to an opening goal midway through the first half. Even a 48-minute mid-game delay due to the threat of lightning failed to dampen Miami's enthusiasm. But after Breck Shea's clever touch and Blaise Matuidi's perfect delivery, Higuain also found Houston goalkeeper Marco Maric in fine form. Miami's persistence eventually paid off, albeit with help from Dynamo defender Alias Struna, who got rather too tight to Leandro gonzalez Pires. Having missed his side's previous penalty, Higuain passed spot-kick duties to Morgan, who deservedly gave the home team a 57th-minute lead. Houston rarely threatened, and when they did benefit from some sloppy Miami defending, they couldn't negotiate with goalkeeper John McCarthy. Miami's lead preserved as they registered back-to-back -back MLS wins for the first time. Three defeats in a row, no goals scored, and nine conceded. FC Cincinnati need to figure something out. Hello, three nothing. They hosted Toronto FC, who'd clocked up four straight victories. One more from Toronto on the fast break. One more was all the Canadians needed to become the first side to clinch a playoff place. Commentary comes from Mike Sewell. Pozuelo. Just reached by Liam Fraser, who sets Azorio free, cuts it back. Here's Pozuelo again. Excellent running by the Spaniard, who began the move and almost finished it with a goal. Really cut back by Azorio. Pozuelo. For some space, gets the cross in, but it's cleared by Cincinnati to Delgado. Back out wide to Pozuelo again. Here's Laria, all the way to the dead ball line. Here's Mullins! Cleanly struck by Patrick Mullins to give Toronto the lead. It's his first goal since scoring against Cincinnati in this fixture last season. Patrick Mullins makes it 1 0. Van der Veff on to Kubo, good turn by Yuya Kubo, on to Vasquez. 
as a sight of goal is parried by Quentin Westberg. Brandon Vasquez released by Kubo. A shooting opportunity, albeit from a fairly acute angle. Hagland is underneath this one, but heads it only as far as Piatti. De Leon on to Piatti again. Good cut back. Oh, and it almost finds its way through. Good goalkeeping by Teton. It took a slight deflection of Van der Werf. Out wide to Medunian in. It's a decent cross, and down goes Alan Cruz. And the referee has pointed to the penalty spot for a foul by Omar Gonzalez, who's rather dismayed. So Alan Cruz against Quinton Westberg, or at least we think that's the case because referee Sabiga has gone across to check a video review and he has reversed his decision and there will be no penalty. Simon. It's a strong back pass by Simon, which almost caught out his goalkeeper. Delivered by Medunian in. Hagland was underneath it, but unable to keep the ball down. Cincinnati looked for an equaliser. De Leon will just try and eat up the last few seconds of this game. And indeed, Toronto have done enough to earn another three points. Greg Vanny's side make it five wins in a row. All right. Disappointment for Yap Stam and Cincinnati. Patrick Mullins' goal takes Toronto into the playoffs. The team has such good character and, and, and guys that have experienced so much now in the last several years. So, you know, we believe here. We know what we're capable of. We have uh, high expectations for ourselves now. And I think to, to clinch a playoff spot so early, it's a huge compliment and says a lot about this club. Fellow Canadians, the Montreal Impact, were at the Philadelphia Union, the closest team to Toronto at the top of the East. And for the first time this season, Subaru Park welcomes supporters into the stadium. It's a great time to be returning to watch the Union. They were the joint top scorers in the Eastern Conference, and the football has been enjoyable on the eye too. Brendan Aronson gave Clement Diop a sample of what they're capable of within the first 30 seconds. But Ilsenio's clever pass and Jamiro Montero's low finish was a combination that Diop and those in front of him couldn't contain. This was Montero's first since the MLS's back tournament. The impact, though, started the second half in the same manner that Philadelphia did the first. Victor Wanyama's presence of mind to drift into the visitors' box was almost rewarded. His strong strike was tipped away by Andre Blake. It was only three weeks since the pair's last meeting with the Union comfortable 4-1 winners at Red Bull Arena. But it's in this stadium where Jim Curtin's team are most dangerous. Sergio Santos finished off a pacey attack that started on the edge of Philadelphia's own penalty area. Six straight home wins now seemed very possible. Though Thierry Henry's team still made it a nervier occasion than last month's meeting, Amir Sadic was born the same year that Henri was named as France's Young Player of the Year and his debut goal in MLS was one his manager would have been proud of. Sadic's influence would have been widely heralded had Romel Kyoto finished off his fabulous through ball late on. Instead, it's five defeats and seven for Montreal. After three consecutive wins, New York City FC had their sights set on a top four finish in the East, but after only three minutes at home to the New England Revolution, they neglected to keep a close eye on Teal Bunbury. In the wake of New England's fast start, NYCFC took a while to settle into the game, but when they did, they put the visitors' defence to the test. Brandon Bai's block from Valentin Castellanos just after half-time was one of several efforts the Revs kept out. They themselves had their fair share of shots on goal, Diego Fagundes was left to his own devices, only to be thwarted by Sean Johnson. 
The clearest chance the Revs had to increase their advantage came with just over 10 minutes left, when Alexander Callens brought down Matt Polster inside his own area. Lee Wynn had recently made his return to New England after two and a half years away, and by converting the subsequent penalty, became the first Revs player to register 50 goals and 50 assists for the club. To NYCFC's credit, they continued to press, but even Tony Roch's mazy run and cross couldn't bring about a goal for either Castellanos or Ismail Tajuri Shradi. The Revs' defence again defiant. From the resulting corner, Callens atoned for conceding the earlier penalty. His first MLS goal in more than two years proved to be nothing more than a consolation, as the Revolution gave themselves a shot at a top four finish. A meeting of interim coaches in Atlanta, though Bradley Carnell is about to step aside at the New York Red Bulls, with Gerhard Struber set to take permanent charge. The Austrian was no doubt watching to see whether his new side could offer a response in a week in which they'd been beaten twice. Daniel Royer's awkward block onto his own crossbar suggested the Red Bulls' luck was changing. And Royer is probably looking forward to fellow countryman Struber's arrival more than most. He's the Red Bulls' leading scorer too, so this was the sort of danger that he's far more used to creating. And his effort at the start of the second half was the catalyst for the game's opening goal. The resultant corner provided 17-year-old debutant Caden Clark with a very special moment. This was some way to win over your new teammates. Clark had only been formally announced as the Red Bulls' latest acquisition hours earlier. The Five Stripes had never beaten their opponents in a regular season game, and there was hardly a hint of any winds of change. Substitute Drew Yearwood was unlucky not to double the Red Bulls' advantage late on. Slim chances presented themselves to both Emerson Hyman and John Gallagher in stoppage time, but Atlanta United have now failed to score in three of their last four matches. The 2018 MLS Cup champions are currently clinging on to a playoff place in the East. DC United's interim coach, Chad Ashton, had some big boots to fill following the departure of DC legend Ben Olsen a few days earlier. Raphael Wicke's Chicago Fire were in no mood to ease him into the role. Barely two minutes had passed when CJ Sapong converted Alvaro Madran's free kick. The fire was so fast out of the blocks that they went within a width of a post of making it 2-0 less than 90 seconds later. Madran showing a blend of nifty footwork and ferocious power. The Spaniard unfortunate not to find the net. Chicago's first half dominance did eventually bring about a second goal. On the stroke of half-time, defender Boris Sekulic was left unchallenged to score for the first time in MLS. DC United had had a tendency to capitulate in similar situations this season, but shortly after the break they pulled a goal back when Jonathan Bornstein put through his own net after Joseph Mora's powerful run. DC's confidence grew, and at the midway point of the second half, they went agonisingly close to equalising. Substitute Ola Kamara's rasping shot raised the top of the Chicago crossbar. It was a determined second-half performance by the black and red, but they couldn't muster a reward for their efforts. Edison Flores was thwarted by Bobby Shuttleworth as the fire improved their chances of making the playoffs. Eleven wins from 17 games has guaranteed Toronto a playoff spot in the East. The main movers this week, though, were the Chicago Fire after they beat DC United. They've jumped ahead of both Atlanta and Nashville into ninth. Despite their defeat to LAFC, Seattle still occupy top spot in the Western Conference, albeit on goal difference from rivals Portland. Only one point separates the Sounders from third place SKC. 
The playoffs are on the horizon. Toronto are over the line and several more are waiting in the wings. Diego Chara, he's going on! This copyrighted broadcast of Major League Soccer may not be retransmitted, reproduced, or rebroadcast without the express written consent of Major League Soccer.